Okay, next on our hit parade, we have uh, David Reich, professor of genetics at Harvard Medical School and an investigator with the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. Uh, David's uh, research focuses on finding complex genetic patterns that cause susceptibility to common diseases among populations. But his involvement in this panel is the result of work that he has done on the deep history of humankind through an examination of DNA evidence, including a 2009 investigation of the origins of uh, the populations of India, which has proven to be a landmark study. So we will hear about real genetics now. Thank, thank you for the opportunity to come speak to this group. Um, and it's um, a particular pleasure to speak after uh, Andrew, Garrett, Andrew Garrett. So I'm going to be talking about work that I've been involved with um, in ancient DNA, which is an amazing new technology that's become possible uh, on a genome-wide scale since 2010, and has made it possible to look at past uh, archaeological cultures where we can obtain skeletons like this one in the photograph, get DNA from them, effectively sequence their whole genome, compare them to individuals from other ancient archaeological cultures and to people today, and to see how they're related. So for the first time, we can trace movements of people and ask the question, were particular transformations in the past associated with archaeological cultures dramatic and identified and explored by archaeologists, so they correspond to movements of people, transmission just of culture or other features. So it's a real revolution in our ability to read this archive of the past. So this is a tree reconstruction of the relationship of Indo-European languages um, by uh, Don Ringe and uh, Tandy Warno and others. Um, and it is different in some of its features from the, some of the trees that Andrew was showing. And I'm not making any claim that this tree or another is right. The relationship amongst Indo-European languages was articulated in a very strong form at the end of the 18th century by William Jones in India who noticed, um, as Andrew said, the connections between Sanskrit and uh, European languages. Um, and no, and uh, that's clear evidence of a strong cultural connection amongst these very geographically disparate places. And it's a very important observation because it indicates that there is some kind of profound cultural contact um, across these regions over this period of time. And so the great question has always been, how did this occur? So what's happened since 2010 is an absolute explosion in the amount of ancient DNA data, beginning with the first genomes in 2010 and a trickle until 2013. Suddenly in 2014 and then in 2015, there's been a vast explosion in the number of individuals with genome-wide data. Um, it's now more than, uh, at the end of 2015, it was more than 300. It's now well more than 1,000. It's rapidly increasing, and it's allowing us to interrogate how these people of the past relate to people of the present. So what happened in 2009 um, was that people began to sequence little snippets of the genome, the DNA, the four letters that make up our, our three billion bases of the genetic code. People were studying mitochondrial DNA, which you receive from your mother, and she receives from her mother and mother's mother, and they were succeeded in getting this out, they were succeeding in getting mitochondrial DNA out of ancient bones. And this is a study from Bramante and colleagues in 2000, there was a study by Bramante and colleagues in 2009 which sequenced bits of the mitochondrial DNA from hunter-gatherers and farmers in Europe before and after about 8,000 years ago when farming came into the region, and noticed that the mitochondrial sequences were almost completely different between the hunter-gatherers and farmers, suggesting a new people had come in. So it was direct DNA proof of, bi of the great new movement of people. In 2012, there was a major paper based on whole genome data, which is about 200,000 times more data than the mitochondrial sequence, and showed that people in, it was a study focused on, oop, on people in, oop, on people in s southern Sweden, and showed that people in southern Sweden about 5,000 years ago were genetically not at all like southern Swedish people today. They were much more similar to people from Sardinia and also closer to people from the Near East. Um, and that uh, the hunter-gatherers of Sweden who were living side by side by the farmers 5,000 years ago because they persisted in that region, both groups, uh, were genetically very different from the farmers. And so it was a multi-ethnic group living side by side, very different from the people today. And they proposed a model of mixture between two ancestral populations, hunter-gatherers and farmers in different proportions leading to populations in Europe today. So. In that same year, in our group, Nick Patterson, my colleague who, who I've worked with for now um, 16 years, found something that didn't seem to be consistent with that same observation. 
so what we developed is a statistical test where we looked across the genomes. The genome is a sequence of a three billion about DNA letters, adenine, cytosine, thymine, and guanine. Between any two copies, say the one you get from your mother and father, you typically have about one difference in every thousand positions. So that's about three million differences between any two copies of the genome, enough to tell you a lot about how those differences accumulated and over time how they accumulated. So what we did is we looked at about 600,000 positions that are different among people, and we asked the question, um, are, we, we looked at, for example, a population like a French population or any other Northern European population, and we asked, are the French frequencies tend to be intermediate in frequency between any two other populations around the world? So we took each population in our data set, for example, French, and then we looked at all other possible pairs of populations in our data set of about 50 worldwide populations, and we saw, are there any populations where the French really look intermediate, as you would expect for mixture? And the answer we got was that we got a very strong, highly significant signal where the French population and other Northern European populations were genetically intermediate between other populations, with the strongest signal giving, being given on the one hand by Sardinians, these populations in the island, in islands of Southern Europe, who we now think of as an isolated group descended from relatively first farmers coming to Europe, and of all people, Native Americans. So this was a good big surprise, and it didn't. <laughs> and and Native Americans were definitely stronger than East Asians or Siberians, um, and it was a it was a hugely statistically significant signal. And statistically, you can show that the only way this can occur is if Northern Europeans are a mixture perhaps of populations related perhaps distantly to Sardinians on the one hand and Native Americans on the other. So this was very exciting, and what Nick proposed was the following, that Sardinians descend from an ancient farming population, perhaps, or an ancient population from the Near East that contributed to Northern Europeans and also to Sardinians, and that Native Americans descend from a population we call the ancient North Eurasians. It's a proposed ghost population, which we don't have any samples from. That doesn't exist anymore. But it existed more than 15,000 years ago descendants of it went into the Americas and contributed to Native Americans, and other descendants of it somehow got into Northern Europe. So we're not proposing movement from the Americas, but rather a ghost population. So what was very exciting was a year later, this ghost population was found um, in bones. Um, S.K. Willerslev's group found a DNA from an individual, a little boy from, from 24,000 years ago, based on its radiocarbon date, from around Lake Baikal in Siberia, and it perfectly matched this predicted source population. It was a better match than Native Americans are, um, and since that time, we found additional populations and more proximate populations to the source populations, both for Native Americans and for Europeans that are related to this group. So this is actually recurrently occur happening now in ancient DNA. We predict ghost populations statistically from the samples we have, and then often we find them, some, some, in some cases we haven't yet found them, and so it's a very exciting thing to be able to do. So now we have two mixtures. One is the hunting, hunter gatherer and farming mixture documented by mitochondrial DNA and nuclear DNA, whole genome DNA, and the other is this thing related to Native Americans, which doesn't seem somehow related to original, the ancient North Eurasians. It's hard to understand how they relate to first hunter gatherers. This model doesn't have European hunter gatherers in it. And the answer is that they're both true. In fact, there's three ancestral populations for Europeans. So in 2014, we obtained DNA from a high-quality DNA from a hunter-gatherer from 8,000 years ago and a farmer from 7,000 years ago. And we did the following thing. So, I'm gonna <coughs> so what we did is we took data from a lot of present-day West Eurasians. So I'm defining West Eurasians as people who are genetically related to Europeans and Central Asians and Near Easterners and people from the Caucasus and people from Iran and so on. Um, and we took those samples, and the type of data we had is we had the same approximately 600,000 positions in the genome, um, which are variable across people. And in this case, we had 777 present-day people who are color-coded here by the populations they come from, but we didn't use the populations in the analysis. And so what you have is a rectangular matrix with 600,000 approximately rows and 777 columns, and you multiply the matrix by itself, and it tells you how closely related each sample is to each other, each other sample. And this is a principal component plot that tries to most efficiently summarize the differences across the samples based on the product of this matrix by itself. And what we found was a really dramatic pattern where West Eurasians form basically two parallel lines. One is, contains essentially all Europeans, that we, European Union Europeans, that, that part of Europe. Um, and this contains everyone from the Near East, ranging from the Levant, southern Israel and, and Arabia, up to the Caucasus, uh, just south of the Caucasus Mountains. And here, 
uh, from Sardinia all the way up to northeastern and northern Europe up here, with very few populations in between. The populations in between are populations of plausible, more recent contact uh, across the mostly Mediterranean and Jewish populations between these two regions. So this is a very interesting observation, qualitative observation, and it suggested to us that two things were going on. One of them was that Europeans can poten potentially contain within themselves admixture, ancestry, from a population that's a ghost population that lived here, that doesn't exist in unmixed form anymore, and that Europeans are a mixture of this group and gr groups that would have lived there, and they formed along this gradient, and that might be the hunter-gatherers. But there's also this dimension, and this, pa this perpendicular dimension, and perhaps that's related to the pattern we see in Native Americans. If we look at Native Americans, they plot up here. So using our data, we found a model of history that was statistically consistent with our data. So I'll just walk you through this. So this Mbuti population is a pygmy population from Africa that we use as a reference point that we think that is genetically consistent that it's being symmetrically related to all these non-African populations. This is an isolated population from, from uh, South, Southeast Asia the Andamanese, Andamanese Islanders. And this is this 24,000-year-old boy from Lake Baikal, and this is this 8,000-year-old European hunter-gatherer. And you can show that these two individuals are symmetrically related to this population. They share mutations at an equal rate with the East Asians, which means they are consistent with descending from a common ancestral population that split earlier from the ancestors of East Asians. So that works. Native Americans, as were shown by another group, are a mixture of these ancient North Eurasians and an ancient East Asian group, which explains why Native Americans have affinity to East Asians, but also have this affinity to Europeans. In fact, they're a mixture of about one-third ancestry related to this ancient North Eurasian group and another anciently related to East Asians. This first European farmers are a mixture of a group related to European hunter-gatherers and some deeply splitting lineage, which is another ghost population that we still haven't found, but we strongly predict now. Um, and Europeans today are a mixture of these three sources, ancient North Eurasians, European hunter-gatherers, and farmers, in the following proportions, which vary across Europe, with the largest proportions being from the first farmers, but big proportions also being from some of these other groups. So how did this new ancestry get there? So the data that we had in 2014 didn't have of this, any of this ancient North Eurasian ancestry in Europe. Um, it was all consistent, just like these original ancient DNA studies, with being a mixture of the hunter-gatherers and the farmers. But today, this ancestry related to the ancient North Eurasians and Native Americans has spread throughout Europe without exception. So how did that happen? So in 2013, a study again of this mitochondrial DNA, these little sequences of DNA from uh, the energy factories of our cell, we, uh, was published, which looked at more than 300 samples from nine successive archaeological cultures, so more than 300 skeletons from which DNA was successfully extracted, all the way beginning from the, the hunter-gatherers all the way to the people at the beginning of the Bronze Age, a little bit after uh, about 4,000 years ago. And what we developed is a test for continuity, whether the pop each successive population is consistent genetically with being just a random sample from the previous population without additional input. And what, when there's a square here, it indicates there's evidence of discontinuity. So there's clear discontinuity between the hunter-gatherers and the farmers, as I mentioned to you before. Oops. Oops. Um, but, um, oops. So, and that continues for all the first few archaeological cultures that are so associated with farming in Europe. But then suddenly there's a discontinuity 4,500 years ago in association with a culture that's archaeologically known as the Cordyware culture. So this was a suggestion that something new came in 4,500 years ago, and maybe this corresponds to what we're looking for. So the subs the two years later, we published a whole genome study, again, similar with a whole series of samples right from that same region in Germany and also some data from Hungary and Spain and Russia, um, a total of 69 and eventually 94 and 163 samples, trying to see when these changes occurred. Here's the picture I showed you before, two parallel lines, Europe and the Near East. And I'm now going to walk you through what the ancient samples look like um, compared to these modern samples. So here again is Europe and the Near East. It's the same dots of all the present day people. And here's the hunter gatherers of Western Eurasia uh, before farming starts. So as I mentioned, the, farm, the hunter gatherers fall beyond Europe in the direction of European differ differentiation from the Near East as expected if Europeans are a mixture of groups related to these. 
These are Scandinavian hunter-gatherers from Sweden. These are Western European hunter-gatherers from Spain and from, from Luxembourg. And these are uh, Eastern European hunter-gatherers from Russia. You, so you see this, this gradient of north-south gradient is already present among the amongst the hunter-gatherers. This is this 24,000-year-old boy. So the first farmers show a massive shift. So these are people from, uh, from, from um, uh, first farmers from Northern Europe and from Spain, and also Anatolian farmers uh, fall in the same place from, from Tur Turkey. And it's quite clear that a population related to Turkish farmers who arrived 8,500 years ago, oops, I keep, this, this, I keep losing control of this thing, um, uh, is, uh, appears here and it falls on top of where Sardinians fall, consistent with the idea that Sardinians are an isolated descendant from these first farming populations. Over time, what happens in Europe over the next couple of thousand years is there's a slight leftward shift of these populations as they mix with local hunter-gatherers who have not yet been absorbed. And we see this again and again in ancient DNA. There's a first impact of a migrating population, and then it takes a couple of thousand years for them to integrate and, and mix to some extent. Meanwhile, in Eastern Europe, a population forms called the Yamnaya, and the Yamnaya we have data from. This is from the far Eastern Europe near the Urals, and they're intermediate between the northern tip of this Near Eastern group and the uh, hunter-gatherers of, of Europe, and we uh, of Eastern Europe of, uh, of the hunter-gatherers of Eastern Europe. And what's clearly happening is there's populations from the Near East coming and mixing with the European farmers and the European farmers here, but also something happening here with another type of Near Eastern population at the other end of this gradient. But populations like those you see in Europe today over here, for British people, uh, Northeastern Europeans, Southern Europeans have not yet formed. And then suddenly they form 4,500 years ago. Suddenly what you're seeing is mixtures of people related to this and people related to this, they form. So here's a summary of this evidence. So population changes after the advent of agriculture. If you take these bars as a measurement of the percentage of first farmer ancestry derived from Anatolian Turkish farmers, it starts out at about 100% amongst the first farmers in Europe. It's actually, we now think it's more like 90%. We think these numbers are a little bit overestimated. Um, over time, there's more hunter-gatherer ancestry comes into these populations. As um, they mix with the local hunter-gatherers who have not yet disappeared. Suddenly, 4,500 years ago, suddenly this green component appears that's related to the ancient North Eurasians, but in fact, it's larger than the proportion of ancestry from the ancient North Eurasians because the ancient North Eurasians are mixed in this population and the actual contribution in these corded ware complex people is at least 70%. It's a massive replacement of the German population. And ever afterward, in Northern Europeans, there's a large proportion of ancestry from this group. This is the single most important contributor to European populations in many places, especially in Northern Europe today, and it comes from the East. <coughs> so this is steppe ancestry. We have individuals from the steppe who have this ancestry, and it's plausibly related to this group called the Yamnaya. So a model, a summary, is that the population uh, of Europe was in the last, in the last 10,000 years was massively transformed by two major migrations. After 8,500 years ago, a mass movement of farmers into the region that mixed with local hunter-gatherers, and after 4,500 years ago, a mass movement of steppe pastoralists who mixed with the established mixture of hunter-gatherers and farmers. And today, Europeans are largely a mixture of these three ancestral components who have had many important, profound, interesting changes in terms of the population since that time, but they've been mixtures and swishings and swirling arounds of these same components. A strong suggestion might be that the languages spoken by this later movement of people would have been Indo-European. It's so late that these ha and it's such a large number of people that it seems likely that some of these languages were brought by, uh, were Indo-European Indo languages. And so the suggestion is, is that this may be related to the spread of Indo-European languages. So I just want to back up in connection to the Indo-European language problem. So the ancient DNA has falsified um, uh, the single strongest argument in my view, and also in Colin Renfrew's view, I think, uh, who was the person who introduced it, for the idea that the source of, of Indo-European languages in Europe would have been the movement of farming. What Renfrew thought was that migrations, mass movements of people are rare in human history. They happen sometimes, but that it's, they happen rarely. And that the only plausible one that would have happened in the last 10,000 years into Europe would have been the movements of farmers because they had a 
lifestyle advantage compared to the hunter-gatherers would have been able to more densely occupy space. And once a densely settled farming population was established in the region, it would have been very hard for anybody to make an impact. Just like in India, the British and the Mughals have been there for hundreds and hundreds of years and have made hardly any demographic impact on India because they've been vastly outnumbered by the locals. And yet, what the genetics shows is that that's not true in Europe. In fact, there's been a massive impact of these people. So I think that, that, that that's a problem for the single strongest argument. The first culture with step ancestry in our data is the Corded Ware culture, or co complex, who have been linked archaeologically to the step in the Yamnaya and genetically now too. Um, uh, and so the Corded Ware complex people who we have genetic data from and who are genetically relatively homogeneous almost certainly spoken into European language, and this supports some version of a step hypothesis to explain at least some of the languages of Europe. Sort of speaking a little bit more broadly to the question of their step-related ancestry in India, in 2016, we published a paper on ancient DNA from the ancient Near East. And um, this is complicated and unresolved in particular because we, there's no ancient DNA from India right now because the, the DNA thermal conditions make DNA preservation more difficult, although the progress is now being made. But if you look at the proportion of uh, ancestry and step and Iranian-related step and Iranian inferred West Eurasian related ancestry, uh, step ancestry is confidently inferred to exist in almost every Indian group, both Indo-European speakers without exception, and the relative proportion of, of, in, of, of step related compared to Iranian related ancestry as inferred by this model, which is not a perfect model, is uh, consistently higher in, in groups that speak Indo-European languages, consistent with the idea that there might be a contribution from a Yamnaya-related population in India. So there's also very strong evidence from the Y chromosome, which b boys inherit from their fathers who inherit from their fathers, that large fraction of the male ancestry in India is related to a large fraction of the male ancestry in Eastern Europe within the last five to 7,000 years, again, consistent with that chronology and documenting clearly movements between these regions in some way. But popular models of the step hypothesis of Indo-European language origins do not seem compatible with the data in some ways. So often in the story told within the step hypothesis, um, the Yamnaya, which is this culture that expands over the step beginning 5,300 years ago um, and expands into dramatically to the west and also to the east um, in another, the form of an other culture, um, transmits uh, to India and Iran through these cultures called Sintashta and Andronovo that follow it. But we have genetic data from those populations, and they're mixed with European first farmer ancestry, which is not present in India, so it rules out that model. Um, we also see no evidence of steppe migration through the Balkans into Anatolia, because there's time series data now through the Balkans, and there's no evidence of steppe ancestry uh, in the Balkans or even in the, sample, the sporadic samples we have from Anatolia. So the model that people have been thinking about, about a source in the steppe, which transmits these Hittite languages through the Balkans, um, and impacts Anatolia, there's just no support for it in the genetic data. And in fact, there's contradiction in terms of certain suggestions in India. So th that quest those questions are very much up in the air. So um, this is this tree, and the Yamnaya are suggested as being a plausible vector for the expansion of these languages. It's not the language ancestral to all of these languages, including Hittite, but to all of the ones that William Jones highlighted Sanskrit and Latin is plausibly an ancestor, and so I think that the genetics has made some progress in that direction. Thank you, David. That was uh, masterful and very, very interesting. Uh, time for questions. Here's one. At least, okay, good. Thank you, that was, that was superb. Uh, Alan Marcus Aberdeen, can I ask you, in the way in which your uh, latest research might shed some additional light on three, three groups, the Basques, uh, the Gypsies in Scotland, who apparently discussion about their emanating originally from India, and the Sami in northern Sweden. Okay, so I'll take those in turn. So the Basques are one of these uh, linguistic uh, isolated groups they, in Europe, there's not many of them. They speak a non-Indo-European language, which is spoken in southern France and northern Spain. Um, uh, genetically, the Basques have some of the steppe ancestry, but they perhaps have a little bit relatively less of it than some of their neighbors, perhaps because it's 
And a model that's consistent with the data is that this is an isolated population derived from what was spoken in Europe before these step-derived languages came in. So that's a plausible working model that we as geneticists and others are interested in. Um, the gypsy uh, populations, the, the data I know is mostly in the, is in the, the uh, southeastern Europe, um, are genetically clearly a mixture of people with South Asian ancestry who have been subsequently mixed with populations they've transited through um, in the last uh, thousand or so years, um, and um, which is consistent also with the linguistic connections to India. There's clearly South Asian ancestry in that population. Finally, the Sami, which is a Arctic population in Scandinavia um, uh, and speaks, uh, I think, a Finno Ugrian language like uh, Finnish and, and, and Estonian, um, have uh, clear additional affinities to East Asians that are not present to the same extent or at all in other European populations. And um, there are hints in the data which are not very strongly confirmed that this might reflect uh, later. Uh, two or three thousand year old or three thousand year old movements from from that region into Europe but perhaps later events there's a question back there yes uh, Judith Resnick New Haven Connecticut what's the theory for the migrations sorry the question is what's the theory for migration <coughs> you said that we you've Sorry, why did these things, why did these why migrations did people occur? migrate? Where did the great migrations come from? Uh, uh, that is not something that as a geneticist I'm an expert on. <laughs> so I think that that's actually something that I prefer almost not to speculate on. So as a geneticist, I think that what we can add most is documentation that events occurred. And then archaeologists are really in the best position to explain how. Um, there has been an interesting observation from uh, S.K. Willerslev and uh, Christian Christiansen's group, um, which uh, has looked at these data from steppe peoples and has found in the teeth of, from which we've obtained DNA, pathogen DNA um, from the steppe. And the pathogen DNA is from Yersinia pestis, the black death pathogen, um, dating to four to five thousand, as old as four to five thousand years ago. And a model that they very tentatively suggested, which is interesting to think about, it was 7% of these approximately 100 samples they looked at, they detected it in, and the, the detection was not even perfect, so perhaps it was more. And if people die of, with black death in their teeth, they died of it because it doesn't stay in your bloodstream. So a possibility is that this black death or other pathogens are endemic on the steppe, and Europe was a naive population, and they passed it to Europe, and there was a population collapse related to epidemics, perhaps related to the one that caused the Native American population collapses when Europeans got there, which would kind of be ironic if it was true, because, um, because we often think, oh, Europeans have been spending thousands of years leaving cheek by jowl against their, with their animals and built up all this immunity, and perhaps actually these big, great transformations in Europe are precipitated by that, but that's very speculative, and I think there's a lot more to do. I think the big question is how these people did it, how these people moved into this densely populated region when they were pastoralists, not farmers, when they presumably used the landscape less efficiently. And that's an open question for archaeologists. We now know it happened. The question is to explain why. A few hundred years later, after this movement of the corded ware into Central Europe, they arrived in Britain and achieved an even larger replacement of the population. And so uh, it's a very dramatic event. You know, I, I think we have time for one more question. Dr. Shapiro. Erwin Shapiro, Cambridge. I was wondering, given the uh, impetus these days for interdisciplinary research, whether any groups were forming of people from your end of things on, on the genome and the language end of things like um, Dr. Garrett, whether any groups were forming to mutually consider these issues and why they're contradictory and what might <clears throat> be learned by combining forces and understanding some of these discrepancies? Yeah, I, I, that's a great question, and I think that that's the future. Um, I think that um, uh, the, uh, an example of this is a new institute that's been uh, set up in, Max, in, in Jena in Germany, which is the Max Planck Institute for the Science of History, and there's a department of genetics and a department of linguistics and a department of archaeology, and the hope is to bring these communities together. It's not something done as much in this country, um, but I think that that's something that in general is uh, the future of trying to integrate this type of information. Um, this is a very powerful type of information, genetic data. It's a little bit like radiocarbon dating seven, 60 or 70 years ago, which established a chronology for the past, which people didn't know about before, and quickly 
uh, overturned a lot of assumptions people had about which groups came first and who influenced who in the same way that genetics is very quickly making it clear which groups migrated where and which groups didn't migrate, and it makes it possible to then ask the questions that archaeologists and linguists have perhaps not been able to resolve because it was important to know whether there were migrations or not. And so in a way, this just opens up um, for those other people in those other fields the ability to address and answer those questions which were uh, dependent on this, de depended on these questions of migrations before, and now those are resolvable. I think we might say that this, uh, a, a gathering like this today, a panel of this sort, is exactly the first step in that direction that, that you're signaling. So I think we have to cut, is that right? So uh, thank you very much, uh, both speakers.